yourself. <laughs> good afternoon, good afternoon. Hello. I love it. It's nice to be here with you all in Detroit. My name is Demarcus Davis. I am the founder and CEO of Music Book. I'm a violinist who, after graduating from the SF Conservatory, decided to start a tech company uh, in hopes of making money. Um, <laughs> fortunately, after a few years, we grew to more than 250,000 students, and we were a tech company set off with the goal to help musicians make money in this new day and age. A um, few years later, ended up on Forbes 30 Under 30, next to some notable names such as Doja Cat and Miley Cyrus. And, <laughs> and today, um, I still operate as the founder and CEO of Music Book and also do arts consulting. And I just want to say, you all are in for a treat when I got the opportunity to speak with the Sphinx team about talking about tech and how we can use it to amplify our impact. This was the dream panel, and they are all here. So um, please just, before I even go into these intros, please give a hand clap for these incredible people who I'm about to tell you about. <laughs> so to my left, I have the incredible Aubrey Bergauer. Aubrey is, yes. Oh, wow. Hey. Aubrey is a graduate of Rice University. She is an arts administrator and a speaker, and she's been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Entrepreneur Magazine. I could continue, but I'm not. She has been called the Steve Jobs of classical music and the Sheryl Sandberg of the symphony. Additionally, she is notably the C was notably the CEO of the California Symphony, where she doubled the audience's size and quadrupled their donor base. How many people could benefit from that? A few. And also, she is the author of Run It Like a Business, which is releasing on February 6th. Yes. Please give it up for Aubrey. Thank you, guys. As we move down the panel, uh, we are joined by Drew Ford, who is also known online as That Viola Kid. Um, Drew is a Grammy Award winning violist. He's a composer, a social media influencer, and he's the founder of Whole Soul Music. Um, in addition, he graduated from the Juilliard School and Mercer University and has performed alongside such incredible artists as Adele, who many of you all probably saw him, and Kanye West. Um, additionally, he can be heard on the soundtracks of such films as Avatar, Transformers, and the recent box office hit, The Color Purple. And finally, he writes a newsletter, which you all can actually sign up for, called Grace Knows. Please get up, give it up for Drew Ford. <laughs> and then last but totally not least is Richard Lonsdorf. Um, Richard Lonsdorf is the creative producer and the executive director of, is a creative producer, excuse me. See, I'm talking too fast. There we go. Is a creative producer, and he's the executive director of the New Century Chamber Orchestra. Um, he's worked with the New York Phil, the LA Philharmonic, the San Francisco Symphony, and many others, and he's also a graduate of Stanford Business School. His career highlights are pretty astounding. They include being the brain behind some of the most financially successful programming in the country. When you look at the San Francisco Symphony Soundbox or the LA Philharmonic's 100th anniversary drone show, Richard was the brains behind it. And a fun fact is that he also worked for Shakira. So please give it up for Richard. So I want to set us up a little bit. Oftentimes when we think about tech, we think it's really expensive or that it's only reserved for larger organizations. Um, and in our industry, we're historically analog. If you think about the way that we've taught music, we sit in a room with the teacher who passes on the information that their teacher and their teacher taught them. And so it can be a little bit daunting when you think about how should I put technology into my organization and how will it benefit me? Um, additionally though, it can be really scary when you hear things like AI and how quickly AI is moving and AI is taking people's jobs. I'm here to tell you all, AI is not taking any of our jobs anytime soon, but if we do not catch up, it could. Um, but then finally, I think this is exactly why we should all be thinking about technology and employing a technology strategy. But the question I always have is, what are we to do as independent artists? What are we to do as heads of community organizations and as leaders of music ensembles? Where does that leave us? So first, I want to throw this question out. What would you all say to a person who's afraid to use technology and doesn't know where to start? And why is technology personally important to you all in your musical work? Aubrey, I'm going to go to you first. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit to start and say I was looking up the definition of small business because we were talking about how does technology help us as small organizations. Just to give the definition, a small business in America has revenue under $40 million 
and employees up to 1,500, up to 1,500 employees. So pretty much every classical music organization, no matter your size, is a small business. So I just want to start there because I always say, or often say, classical music doesn't scale down very well. <laughs> and we know it's hard when you have, no matter your budget size, it always feels like you don't have enough people or enough resource, right? Like just no matter, it's just a very, very lean, lean uh, industry. And so given that framework, when we talk about technology, it's not, I would say, ever a reason to say we're so small we can't do it, whatever it is, but to say, no, 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 it's technology that allows us to be so lean. And I'll just finish this preamble by saying there are just so many tools available now that were not even available five, six, seven years ago. So that's my first answer to the question is just we got to start somewhere because starting is better than nothing. Amen to that. And why is technology personally important to you in your musical work? Still me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think for so many of the reasons I just said, because I've seen it firsthand of like any time I feel like, I think the default in our business, because it is such a labor intensive industry, is to think I need more people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's true, but I've found, especially more in recent years, like no, actually, maybe there is an app for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think, like for me personally, I moved from running an organization, cutting my teeth at bigger institutions, to then becoming a solopreneur, and I've only recently staffed up with a team. So for the first three years, I'm now on year four of that, the first three years it was me and a bunch of a tech stack, right? And so personally, yeah, I see how technology has helped me scale before I was able to, to grow with people. Amen to that. And I want to add into um, a point that Aubrey just made. We are all small businesses. When we start to think about ourselves, even as musicians, all of us who teach, can I just see by a show of hands, how many of you all have taught a lesson or actively teach music lessons? Mm -hmm. That means that you are a small business, whether you make $20 this year, or maybe, whether you make 200000 each of us is a small business. That's information that has to be reported, and so it's really important for us to think like that. Richard, I'm going to throw it down to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, would, what would you say is the reason why technology is so important to you, and what would you say to these people if they're a little bit afraid of getting involved in it? Yeah, I think it's a tool for connection, you know, and, I, and I believe that very strongly. I'm not necessarily as invested in the technology, say, of social media and other things. Um, I kind of leave that to other people, but for me, it's it's what can we do when we have this gathering of people in a room to bear witness to something that we are putting on stage? How can technology help everyone in that room connect w with the performers on stage and with each other? I think that's the real power of, of, of what I often call production value. And, and it's something that I have used a lot in my work uh, to really augment the storytelling power of music. And I think that's something that is not often, well, sorry, I think I know that that is something that is not often considered in this business, um, where we are still, shockingly, I sort of joke that we're one of the only art forms out there that still puts things under plain white light on a blank stage and says, here you go, people, you know, <laughs> and like, and it's, it's just think of like almost anything else you can buy a ticket for and go see, it comes with many, many levels of, of detail and, and, and depth and nuance that, that unlock its potential. And I just think that for orchestras and other arts organizations not to be thinking about how they can expand uh, the world of tools that we use on stage and in a concert hall, um, it, 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 it's to our detriment, you know, and that, that's a way in which you say, you know, we're being really left behind if we don't um, start having fun and experimenting. So that's, I mean, that's my whole kind of reason for being in this, in this business. I love it. And Drew, last but not least. <laughs> So it's really interesting because they both said similar things that I was going to say. So I'm just going to summarize. Uh, personally, like I think technology is really, really important because it allows you to take your tools with you wherever you go. Um, specifically, I've been using technology to build my string quartet whole soul from 2022 to 2023. I 6.7x our income just using tools. Um, the one I specifically use is called Notion. Have you, has anybody heard of Notion? 
I am, I love it so much because it allows me to have one tool that does many things. Plans, uh, keeping track of critical business tasks, accountability, project planning, all these things that big organizations uh, often delegate to multiple people, I do for myself and I do for my string quartet. And so I think what's really powerful about technology is it kind of gives you way more leverage based off of things that you do every single day. It just allows you to take it with you and transport it to other people so everybody can be on the same page. Um, but what's most important is picking the right tool for you. Mm -hmm. Just because like I use a specific tool or DeMarcus uses a specific tool or Aubrey or Richard, whatever, the best tool you, ha you have is the one that you have and the one that works. But I, if you don't have tools, I really, really implore that you look into using technological tools to scale your business. I absolutely love that. Um, something that you kind of hit on that I don't think we talk enough about, and it's a little bit of a pain point for a lot of us as artists. Um, as artists, we are typically creative people, i.e. we are unorganized, and <laughs> technology makes it possible for us to organize. When you're organized, you can make more money, you can bring in more audiences. And so I want to start to hit on that. Richard, I'm actually coming back down to you. Okay. How has technology benefited you with helping create new and younger audiences? Something we hear a lot about is these organizations that, hey, we're dying, it's not enough young people in the audience. You have done that. Yeah, I, I think it's, first of all, it's not a problem that has been fully solved, but it is a matter of um, creating the opportunity for a dialogue between you and your audience. You know, I, I often say that a concert should be more of a conversation than a presentation uh, because you know, you, you as an organization uh, or as artists are, 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 are choosing to share something with a group of people or with the world. And I think um, what we suffer from in this industry is kind of the lack of ability to connect with audiences because the kind of cultural framework that built classical music is really no longer relevant to a lot of audiences today. And, and so the question then is not only what do we perform that has more meaning and relevance to people, but also how do we start to unlock this very abstract, complex, um, you know, product that we offer so that people can show up without having to do their homework or without having to, you know, like go to school or, or whatever and um, can just kind of embrace what's being offered to them and engage with it, debate with it, question it, you know, all of the things that you might want to, want to provoke in an audience. And so, like, that has been the way that I think, you know, for instance, the Soundbox series at the San Francisco Symphony immediately reached a younger audience. It was just uh, kind of a, 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 a floodgates moment on some level because suddenly there was this offering in a flexible club space with a very different kind of tone and, and flow uh, where the production value actually, you know, made it for one piece could go seamlessly to the next piece without, you know, 10 minutes of shuffling chairs and stands around and moving a piano into a hole or something <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? Thinking about a concert like a show as a piece of, dare I say it, entertainment, you know? I mean, it's like, it's like this phantom <laughs> phrase. And so, you know, that's really what I have seen the benefit of is that, um, you know, you're meeting people where they are, and technology gives a visual language you can communicate with, different audio tools, spatial tools. You know, I see a performer moving through the audience on some level is technology, uh, but on some, it's just it's a decision you can make about how to style the show so that um, you know, there's just different ways to connect than just a pure abstract immediate engagement with a piece of music. Mm -hmm. And for those of you all who haven't seen Soundbox, I just want to emphasize Soundbox is a really incredible production because you walk into this space that feels like a nightclub. It's giant screens, it's dark, there's alcohol everywhere, it's great. Wait, drinks really like, help. They do, they get people in the door. So really incredible space and again, out of this man's mind. Aubrey, I want to throw it to you for a second. How do you think about using technology when we talk about building more diverse audiences? Yeah, I think, I mean, I. I love everything Richard said in production value, and then now this would be like shift categories to like in the office working with the database. So <laughs> womp womp, Aubrey brings us to the boring stuff. But, um, but the truth is we all know we have to better leverage our, <clears throat> in particular our database, our CRM, on this topic of audience development, uh, which representation is a part of that conversation, of course. And so what I mean by that is pretty much all of us, especially at an ensemble or organization, institution, has some sort of a CRM, but to be able to 
properly use that tool is where I think there's different kind of levels that I see regularly of just understanding knowledge, that sort of thing. And so particularly when we talk about the conversation of diversifying our audience, you know, programming is a way to attract younger people in the doors, but then anybody who follows my work will know the first thing I say is, well, what's your retention plan to get those people to come back? Mm -hmm. And so how do we do that? Okay, that's the CRM. If we can't segment our patrons to know, okay, these are first timers and this is the process we're gonna take them through, the follow-up email, the follow-up postcard, the whatever, to invite them back again. I mean, this, I don't know if this sounds rudimentary, but it's a use of technology that not every organization has mastered, so that's a place to start. And that's where I think of when I start thinking of um, the integration with using tools, and then it gets into, oh, Aubrey, that sounds like a lot of work if we're gonna email our follow, our follow up and email our first timers to get them to come back again. I'm like, well, you can automate that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then it starts getting into, okay, what's the tech stack and how do we uh, deploy these tools that are available? I love it. And that's a perfect transition when we start talking about email marketing to Drew. Uh, mm -hmm. Drew, again, I'm, I'm hang, hanging on to this email list of his. Please sign up. It's great content. But Drew, you have built a following of over 100,000 people on social media. Can you talk to me a little bit how, about how social media played, or excuse me, technology played a role in you building that audience? And then perhaps you can go a little bit into about how you think about monetizing those people. So when building an audience, I couldn't have done it without technology. I started with zero followers. 2013, I was a junior at Robert McDuffie Center for Strings in Georgia, and I had a, a moment, I was like, so if I wanna do this music thing, if I wanna be a performer, if I wanna perform viola, does anybody really wanna come see me play? Does anybody even know I exist? And both of those answers were no. And I was like, okay, so how do I, <laughs> Honest. I'm, I'm like, I play viola. Like, <laughs> it's, it's very simple. The math is not mathing. So I figured, okay, maybe I need to build an audience. And that was like the first, uh, first like realization. So then it, the question became, how do I get people to care about what I do? Which is, I think, the question that we always ask ourselves. And I think uh, I, I came up with a solution in that I realized people need to know that you care before they care about what you're doing. So I started thinking, okay, so who is my audience? And I was thinking about middle schoolers who were like just starting the stringed instruments and they were like, ooh, what is it like to maybe even go to school for music? So then I started documenting my life as a student and sharing that using technology, Instagram at the time. And I, I started seeing the first uh, couple of, uh, first couple of followers, first couple of likes and comments, and I realized this was something very interesting. Then I realized, oh, if I am making content because I'm trying to be like that older brother who's just a few years ahead of you, what happens when I graduate? What happens when I start you know, building my career as a musician? So I think that core to it, uh, communicating and documenting your process, your failures, your successes, especially the failures, and trying to posit solutions that you've come up for, with your, for yourself, and sharing that freely and openly is critical. If you do not give value to your audience, if you do not show that you care about them, they're not gonna care about you. And so I deployed this over about a decade, and that's how I built 100,000 followers. Beyond that, Monetizing is, is a longer, more complicated process because then it's, it's about how do you create products or services for your audience that you've built that actively makes their life better. And it's really hard to do when you're like, man, I'm busking in the subways, you know, I'm, I'm teaching four-year-olds who don't even speak English yet, you know, trying to teach them how to do the, the, the instrument. And then I realized I have to solve this problem for myself. And I, if you don't solve the problem for yourself, you can't really give anybody the solution. So when you're wanting to monetize at least social media, there are a few different ways you can do it. Number one, when you have the audience, you can then uh, leverage that audience for brand deals. But oftentimes you don't have control over that. Uh, a lot of times there are these uh, different businesses that offer influencer services and you can email and you can sign up for it. Uh, for it and you'll get a lot of random businesses that want to send you free stuff so you can post on it. And I didn't like that. 
and so I, I realized, okay, if I really want to fully monetize, I have to um, create a product or a service over time that will allow people to make their lives better. And so that's currently the, uh, the journey that I'm on. The majority of my revenue is not from social media. I, I'm a performer. I'm a professional musician. I'm a freelance musician in Los Angeles. So social media is like uh, pretty much my business card and my brand right now. I love that. And I just want to call out, Drew just listed a number of different revenue streams. And while he talked about not every one of them worked for him, that doesn't mean that they won't work for you. And I think that's something that's so important for us to think about as artists. Even though he maybe didn't like uh, getting new products in and then doing reviews on them, that might be someone in here's thing. Like people might send you bows to try out and then boom, you get to keep them. And you just talk about them and you're making money that way. So there is an infinite amount of ways and revenue streams that we can use as artists. And I think the other thing that you talked about is creating value and being authentic. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we uh, did in my company music book is very early on, we got an investor called Techstars and their motto is give first. And so every time we went out into the community, we were always giving. We gave away free music lessons. We gave away free master classes. And that is why we were able to ultimately build a following of musicians who then when we created a product for them, everybody wanted to use it because they went, this organization has already created a ton of value for me. Now, Aubrey, I want to come back over to you. You talked about getting those new people in the door and you talked about now once you get them, retaining them. How do you think about new subscriber engagement? And is this something that people can learn about in your new book, Run It Like a Business? <laughs> oh, you're so good. <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes, you can learn. <laughs> uh, so I do talk a lot about first-timer retention. I'm just going to throw some numbers out. Nationwide, around 90% of first-time attendees at symphony orchestras never come back. That data is true for the largest orchestras and then Budgets of all sizes that I've worked with have had numbers similar to that too. Um, for subscriptions though, this is another really important threshold where we see a big drop off. In the book I call it the first year cliff. So for subscribers, the national statistic is that about half don't renew their subscription. So this matters, one, because of the recurring revenue and obviously we want to grow our subscription base, but also it matters for the development pipeline because the number one indicator of becoming a donor prospect is if you have longevity with the organization and particularly longevity in the form of subscription. Okay, so we're playing a long-term game here. So when half of first year subscribers don't renew, that's a problem. Okay, so just to tease this a little bit, um, there are things we can do. I did a lot of research looking at the broader subscription membership economy. Why is subscription, why is the subscription model working everywhere else? Mm -hmm. Netflix, Amazon, you know, whatever, name it. And yet in the arts, we're like, ooh, it looks like this. And, <laughs> like, and it's dead. And it's like, no, 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 it's not dead. We're doing something different. It turns out we are doing some things different. So very briefly, because I know we don't have time to unpack it all, but uh, to this conversation, how the tech stack can help us is particularly with onboarding. So one of the things we don't do is onboard our new subscribers very well. A lot of times it's like confirmation email, ticket mailing, see you at the show. <laughs> so, sort of. I mean, maybe some organizations do a little bit more. Oh, I bet there's a really nice cover letter on the ticket <laughs> mailing. I forgot that one. But, um, and I, I don't mean to be overly snarky about this, but because for a long time that's what I was doing too. So. No shame, but, um, but what I've learned is everything that we invest later, sending them 5,000 subscription brochures in the mail when we're trying to renew them to year two, instead invest some of that money up front and onboarding. What does that mean? What's the email welcome sequence? I mean, this is not rocket science, but so few organizations have a welcome email sequence for their subscribers. Okay, that's something very tactical we can all do in our work at our organizations. And I give that as one example for onboarding, but there's a whole bunch of other research of how do we help them utilize their benefits. If we watch more shows on Netflix, we're more likely to renew that subscription. So how do we make sure our subscribers take advantage of the benefits we work very hard to offer them? So I could go on and on, but there's a lot of ways. So then when we start looking at technology, okay, that means if somebody misses a performance and we want to make sure they have a free ticket exchange, okay, we're going to have to be able to pull a report of who were the no-shows, then give the box office that list to call them. This is like a combination of analog and tech happening. Um, 
But I say this just to say, like, this is a real example of, oh, yeah, no, our technology, if, again, goes back to CRM. If we're using it properly, we can pull that list. If we're automating an email sequence, we can make some of these things go faster. So I don't know if this sounds basic or not basic, but um, anyways, I talk about it a whole lot more, this whole subscription economy stuff, but I hope this helps a I, little. It does, it does. Um, in just a moment, we are going to open up the floor to questions, and I want to remind everyone, if you go into your Sphinx app and you click Live at 42 North, if you put in 42N as in Nancy, you all can actually submit questions anonymously, and then we're also going to open it up to the floor. Um, I want to go into the last question that I have for the panel of the day. And Richard, this one is for you specifically. Something that we talked about a little bit as a group is the fact that classical music in the United States is basically a European model that's been superimposed on Americans. In that in Europe, classical musicians are government employees, so they're paid by the state. On a Friday night, it is not uncommon for a family to grab a pizza and then go to the symphony. That is not the case here. Our tickets are very expensive, and Richard, you said it best, oftentimes you're walking in to see the same people sit on a stage with white lights. So you have notably created some of the most immersive spaces in the mm. world with soundbox that feels like a club where if I think about what do we do, or let me say my age group <laughs> does every weekend, we go to the club, and the club is... It's red and blue lights on a white floor, but hey, there's a lot of us there. And we go and we do it every weekend. And you know, you grab some alcohol, you see some new people. But you've created these spaces that people want to get often, but mm -hmm. they oftentimes can't. So mm -hmm. how do you think organizations should be thinking about, one, getting subscribers and new members into their facilities every week? And how do you think about that as a mechanism for continuous audience engagement? Yeah, I mean, this is a very complex question. And I think, you know, first of all, it does not succeed without the kind of work that Drew and Aubrey are talking about. Because if people don't know about it or don't have any sense of who you are or haven't been told about it, they won't come. Mm -hmm. But then I sort of see my job is then once they're in the space, is being very present with them. And, and from sort of the moment they walk in the door, you should have an idea as a presenter or as a performer what am I trying to convey this evening to my audience? What do I hope to share with them? What do I hope they might get out of it? And I'll even stop there and say, these are questions we often do not ask. <laughs> you know, like we'll just put concerts up there because this goes with that. And well, musicologically, Haydn was friends with Mozart and blah, blah, blah. You know, like, and like, who knows? Who knows this stuff? And, and I think, so it's like back up a level in your programming and actually work with your colleagues and your music directors, your artistic directors to really think about like, what is the point of this evening, the premise of this concert, and then how can we use some of these tools of immersion to bring that story to life? And I think, you know, I have now worked at organizations, you know, as large as the LA Phil with the drone show, um, which again was for their 100th anniversary gala, and the point of the drone show was how do I tell the 100 year history of the LA Phil in five minutes before the drones run out of batteries and drop <laughs> from the sky, you know? <laughs> And so I went through the archives and found old audio of music directors talking about music, imagery of the different concert halls that the organization has lived through, like big iconographic sort of statements that sort of just would click with that very particular audience, you know. Now then to New Century, which is a much smaller organization, you know, I'm working with an under $2 million budget. Um, you know, it's, it's um, we did a show kind of around Halloween and Day of the Dead. We finally brought in the candles because I didn't want the candle people eating our lunch forever. You know, we uh, just did a partnership with the Conservatory of Music in San Francisco where they had set up a 360 degree video and lighting projection system in their concert hall. And I said, this is a perfect spot for our program about nature and music and bringing some of these natural landscapes to like the to life you know the ocean the desert uh, and having pieces that directly spoke to that experience so that the that audience walks into the room and immediately sees ah I'm at the beach I'm interested I'm relaxed you know and then it progresses from there taking them up into the sky and then back down to earth again you know there's a sense of an arc and a narrative and the technology helps you tell that story. I think that's really my thing, is, is I've been to a lot of bad concerts, as I'm sure many of you have, um, and even ones with visuals where there's just no particular connection or rhyme or reason. And I think that's why I implore this group that 
there's everything from, I'll even say one of the examples from Soundbox very quickly, I know we have to move on, was like we worked with the singer Devon Tynes, fabulous superstar now. Um, but even in that moment, we had him just walk through the audience singing uh, these Caroline Shaw songs and, and just the power and proximity of his voice to members of the audience, particularly who were not expecting an opera singer to show up five feet from their face, mm -hmm. was, they were just stopped in their tracks. And that was like one of the moments they cited in the performance that was just so powerful to them. So like you can think big, you can think small, but I encourage you to use whatever tools you have, partner with organizations that have tools you need, and, and bring them in, but make sure that they're in service of making a compelling evening, because then the Aubreys of the world can encourage them to come back. You know, you have to work hand in hand, but if they don't believe in what they're seeing, you know, it's a lost cause. Mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant what you just said, and I want to point out, you all, even though Richard has worked with some of the largest organizations in the world, the organization he works with most frequently, the New Century Chamber Orchestra, where he's the executive director, they are reflective of what a lot of our organizations look like. They're a medium-sized organization. They put on, what, about six to eight concerts a year? Um, um, a yeah, bit more? four or five programs, basically. Excuse me. Yeah. Four or five programs, and the beauty of what they do is they're in a different facility every single time they go, so it's his responsibility to create a new environment where that mm -hmm. music can speak, no matter if they're in a church or if they're in a cellar. And so Richard really is... We did one in a horse barn in Germany, which was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. So the beauty is our craft can go anywhere. So thank you so much for yeah. that. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to open it up now. Um, if anyone has questions, we have a mic going around. And I also have our first question, which came in anonymously. Um, so this person asked, what are your thoughts on bringing more resistant audiences along with patron-facing technology? Because in our organization, a lot of people were upset about digital programs. Mm. Mm. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Controversial, perhaps, but, but data-based. Data okay. So the people who are still with us, meaning... Literally, a worldwide contagious disease could not keep them away. They're not going anywhere. I feel so dogmatic about this point. The data shows when somebody's been a subscriber for three years, and especially four years, five years, like those kind of people that change is hard. I'm not saying we all need to do digital programs. I'm just saying in this example, that is a great example of somebody who's like, ooh, I, didn't, I don't know how I felt about this and like it, whatever cranky email. That is anecdotal evidence. That is not data, okay? And so there is a bias about that. Ooh, thank you. Okay. Um, I forget the bias name, but there's a bias about this. Like, uh, squeaky uh, wheel or no? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, but basically what the data shows is that the long timers aren't going anywhere. And I know we're trying to get audiences back, but this wasn't from somebody who we're trying to get back, right? This is somebody who's in it. So mm -hmm. with any kind of change, whether it's moving to it's a digital program book or whatever, um, I'm not saying we need to go like super crazy and like scare our audiences, but at the same time, that's not super crazy. That's look at the program on the phone, which you've done for every restaurant you've gone to for the last three years. So not that big of a leap in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I just think the data is there that we don't have to be so, so worried about that. But what we do definitely need to be worried about is how are we replenishing? Mm -hmm. And so that's the part that I think is really important when we're making these kind of decisions. I love that. And I would also add um, something that I talked about some years ago. I took a class with uh, Peter Pistreich and David Gockley, the former executive directors of the San Francisco Symphony and the SF Opera. And we talked about the fact that when you're trying to create new audiences and you're infusing things like technology that the older uh, crowd may be a little bit more apprehensive about, two things can be true. If your organization wants to do digital programs, but these people have been subscribers, like you said, for over a decade, perhaps you print them a Sears catalog at the beginning of the uh, season, you give them their Sears catalog, and it comes out of what they paid for in their subscription, and then everybody else who's coming into the hall scans a QR code. Mm -hmm. It allows them to be happy so they can still flip through the pages. They have something that's a keepsake or a memento, and then everyone else is getting the digital program, and you haven't spent any money to do it. Mm -hmm. So two things can be true in this process. Um, it looks like we have a question from the audience. And also, you're our first person from the audience to give a question, so you have a special prize. Oh my God. A CD from oh. the New Century. Wait, is Drake here? A CD from the New Century Chamber Orchestra. Yes. For your car stereo or maybe your grandparents' house, um, <laughs> we'd be happy to offer you a compact disc. So here, I'll, del I'll deliver it while you speak. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> 
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chloe. I'm a composition student at Boston Conservatory. And my question was, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> my question was like, how would you recommend composers specifically create their brand? Because it's very easy. I have like a lot of friends who are into pop music, R&B. Very easy for them to just make their music, put it out on Instagram, social media, whatever. But for the classical musician, especially a composer, it seems a bit harder. So like, what are some tools that you would recommend to just start building things? Because I'm putting music out, but it's like not as much traction as I would like. So, yeah. I would say think uh, more Joachim and Brahms. You know, finding a artist that you really, really connect with and work with them in tandem. Like if, if it's not about, um, it, it kind of depends on like whether you want to build your brand or if you want to build the brand of your style of music. Like what's the story? What's the through line? I think at least when it comes to brand building, like consistency is really important. And if you really focus on like the story you want to tell as a composer, maybe it's with one artist, maybe it's with a bunch of different artists. How are they similar? How are they different? Why are you choosing these people? And then documenting all of these decisions in real time will allow people to like more relate to you and more relate to your decision making as a composer. Like the all brand is like oh, such a loaded word. Can I just say that brand is such a loaded word? I see everybody rolling their, their eyes when, when I say it. All it is is reputation. What are you known for? What do you stand for? What are you for and what are you against? And that part against is actually really uh, discounted in, in the marketplace. Like being a little bit edgy, being a little bit controversial, taking a stand actually has way more power for building your brand than just like saying what you're about. It's also what are you not about? So thinking about that, think about telling that story and like as a composer, I know it's difficult because you're not the one like always like doing the thing but you're still a storyteller. So tell your story and find out what elements belong and what elements don't. Love that. Yeah. Also, we just got a question um, online that I really love. Someone said, what strategies do you recommend for fostering inter intergenerational connections between audience attendees and donors to ensure inclusivity and sustainability? Oh. Right? So everyone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, right. Can our everyone? audiences be friends with each other? Exactly. <laughs> like, wow, um, never thought of it. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can say something along those lines. I think um, just thinking even back to this powerful experience last weekend so where we had um, for New Century's first time really this kind of immersive uh, visual program, um, our board members were as over the moon as the audience members were. And I think, you know, there's a lot of these discussions even thinking back to that question about like what will my old school patrons think if I introduce something new. I was actually personally, even as much as I've done this, kind of shocked that the um, response to bringing in all of these new elements and just kind of seeing how well they click resulted in board members coming up to me saying that was my favorite program of ours ever, you know, that really we really feel like ourselves again. And it created this energy in the room where, you know, we're there with conservatory students and everything where there's this sense of a collective experience. Um, and you know, people lingered afterwards and chatted. We didn't necessarily facilitate that, but I think one of the things that you can do as an organization is when you create a powerful experience that creates a certain energy in the room and you can actually extend the performance into the after experience as well and actually think about that, you know, there's sort of the welcome phase, there's the meat of the program and then there's the afterglow and how are you preserving that very precious space where people who just bore witness to something together can actually process it together before we all go our separate ways. And, um, you know, that's something very powerful because there's just otherwise very limited opportunities for all the kind of constituents of an organization to be there in the room together. Mm -hmm. that I was just going to add on if I can. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And this is uh, also research backed. Like, if you think of vacation planners, to give an example, um, like the end of the vacation, they the, the beginning and the end, they really focus on because people, consumers, are making decisions about the overall experience within something like the first 30 minutes of that experience. Mm -hmm. So then when I work with organizations, it's exactly what Richard just said. If you're thinking of like the welcome, which by the way, I would say that starts online when they're buying a ticket. That's totally. part of that experience. 
Um, but even if you're thinking they're deciding whether to come back within the first 30 minutes, what have they done? Parked, <laughs> like seriously, but parked, sure. uh, tried to find their seats, um, maybe the orchestra tuned, right? Like probably they, not a lot of music happened before they're already making up their mind. When I started learning the research around this, I was like, oh, holy cow, <laughs> we have so, like the concert part is fine. All this other like welcome yeah. <laughs> segment, we have work to do. And then similarly, the ending matters. So we usually do that part well musically. Usually the end of the concert is really big and wonderful and leaves people on this emotional high. And then what happens? Silence, everybody yeah. exits, <laughs> you know? And so designing, this is a new thing. I write about this in the book too. Like the new th thing I've been thinking of is, oh yeah, we have to actually also facilitate the ending of the experience as well. So, um, and then when we're doing all of that and creating places where people feel welcome, that's mm -hmm. the emotion I would say, welcome, not intimidated, places of belonging, then that really starts, I, I think, to answer that question of like, how can all these people coexist? Well, when it's a place where you feel welcome and like you belong, that commingling gets a lot, lot easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An idea that just popped in my head as both of you all were talking, and this is something that I love. When you all hear Aubrey talk, she talks a lot about using data, and data can be extremely intimidating. Mm -hmm. But one of the pieces of information that we get when we do have a new patron coming into the hall is oftentimes we will get demographic information. What age or group are they a part of? And so an idea that I just had, Remember when we used to be, it was first day of school and you were starting at a new school and the school would send a kid who was maybe on SGA or something to walk you around the school. And so you basically got a new friend your first day in. Why don't we do that at the hall? Mm -hmm. You have these mm -hmm. patrons who've been here sometimes for decades, for mm -hmm. two decades even, mm -hmm. and they always want to, I think the one thing we can agree on is those people want to see the organization survive. We'll make mm -hmm. them a part of it. If you know, hey, tonight we're doing this concert and we have 30% of the audience is new people, let them give a tour of the hall. I'm sure they would, one, feel really appreciated and engaged because they've been there for 30 plus years. So, hey, I'm actually going to take this new group of young people around the hall, but those young people also feel welcomed into this space mm -hmm. where these people have historically been. Yeah. And so it's a simple thing. You haven't spent any money because most of these people will probably volunteer for it anyway, and you've just fostered that intergenerational connection. Yeah. And I think we have a question from the audience. Hi. Okay, you also get oh. a CD from the New Century <laughs> Chamber Orchestra. You get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. Now I have to buy a CD player. <laughs> uh, my name is Alyssa, I'm with McPhail and Madeline Island Chamber Music. Um, when I think about amplifying classical music and technology and some things that happened during the pandemic with classical music that may not be happening as much now, I think about live streaming and pre-recorded uh, performances. Can you talk about your thoughts on that now that we're hmm. quote unquote post pandemic, but there are still access needs for this and how that might impact things? I can kick us off on that one. Um, so at Music Book, we work with a lot of artists who are not only teachers, but they're building their careers. And something that we talk a lot about is most often when you see videos that are pre-recorded, for example, of musicians, there isn't a lot of thought put into it. You're sitting on a recital hall stage, there might be a spotlight on top of you, and then you play the box sonatas, who knows. But there's an opportunity, if we go back to the early 2000s, um, when I used to get up in the morning, there used to be MTV music videos, we had BET 106 and Park, like some of you all know this, mm -hmm. but there was production value behind these videos. And I remember very specifically seeing a video of Joshua Bale playing, um, oh, I think it was uh, Tambourine Chinois, which I'm saying completely wrong, but it was a Chrysler piece. And there was a whole story behind it. There was uh, some girl with long hair who was like his love interest, and they shot a music video. And it was playing next to, I think like Beyonce's Crazy in Love and something else. But it got people looking at it. And so I think the same can be true today. The opportunity and challenge that I see for us as classical musicians is the opportunity is that we basically can go back and do what people did 10 and 20 years ago and it's looked at today as innovative, particularly among our, patro uh, among our audiences. But if we take that a step farther, we can do a lot that other people can't do because essentially, we are cover artists at the mm. end of the day. Mm -hmm. We are covering the same pieces that people have been playing for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So how can we make it special? So I think pre-records in particular are very special. I think in the live streaming space, 
what we've noticed when we look at the data and the trends, there is an opportunity there for additional monetization, but I think it's going to take what each of these uh, panel members have said, it's going to take one looking at data to figure out what trends the right way. You're going to have to be engaged with your audiences already in order to get them to want to tune into these live streams. And I think it's going to take more than a white light on a wood floor. <laughs> huh. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can I underscore please, some please. of that? Okay, yeah. I think, I mean, what you just said, DeMarcus, is so true. And just to say it in some different words, digital content is not a product substitute. And I think mm -hmm. for some of us, I think that pandemic confused that a little bit. Like we developed this amazing muscle collectively to get better at our digital content and particularly streaming. And it was a product substitute then because we could not have our physical product. And so, but now that's not true. And true in the 90s, whether it was BET or true today, mm -hmm. it, digital content makes you want the analog in-person experience when we mm -hmm. do it well. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's a big point to say. But then the other thing is I know it's expensive. And yeah. so mm -hmm. that tends to be, the, I think, maybe the bigger barrier. And what I usually say to organizations is you must have a digital content strategy. Streaming, I believe, should be a part of that strategy. But that does not mean you have to stream everything. It doesn't even mean you have to stream a lot. You could stream. You don't even have to stream the whole performance. I am mm -hmm. a big fan of not giving things away for free Amen. because free has no value. So what does that mean? Stream 10 minutes. That's a lot cheaper than streaming a 90-minute program, mm -hmm. right? So I just think there's different ways to skin a cat. But I think we've just developed such collective competency. Wow, we should leverage that and use yeah. that. Yeah, be, uh, just, I mean, we had exactly the same experience where we were putting everything, you know, doing f fabulous, frankly, and expensive digital productions, and we just cannot continue that in the context of also performing live. But what we have done is occasionally capture concerts that, in my opinion, are visual enough to warrant being videotaped, you know, sorry, videotaped, what am I, from 1980, <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> on, your, on your camcorder. Um, and, but, you know, but, but taking, like, we did a Weimar Cabaret show that was highly visual, I'm going to be looking at some of the archive footage we get from this recent sort of projection show to see if it translates well to video and I'm I'm currently rebuilding kind of our media gallery and like our YouTube you know deployment because I want these things to be like short teasers basically that advertise the organization yes. and give people a sense of a little bit of hunger to want to know more but only choose those things that that say something important about your organization that might entice people to learn more you know it doesn't have to be everything for sure yeah do we have another question from the audience you too get a CD from the new Century Chamber Orchestra. I don't have to buy a CD player. Um, hi, my name is Emmanuel Hill. Um, I'm a violin making student out of Chicago. Uh, if I may, real quick, Drew, I'm also from Atlanta. Shout out. What's up? It's, yeah. Stephanie Voss says hi. Stephanie Voss says hi? Yes, yeah, she does. I love her. That's my former Okay. Boss. Look, the Atlanta delegation. Um, so someone online definitely asked my question, but I'm going to re-ask it differently to see if I can broaden it a little bit. Uh, how can we integrate technology into our business practices so as not to alienate our either older or technology adverse employers, colleagues, uh, or customers? Do I, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, this is like my universe. Um, I think the key thing that I always try to think of is how can I use this technology to make this incredibly special thing that our legacy patrons also feel is incredibly special, how can I use it to make it shine more brightly in a way that um, you know, the current customers will, generally speaking, appreciate and even more so appreciate by virtue of the people that it brings in to share in this thing that they love. And I feel like that works sort of like nine times out of 10. And I think you have to be careful of like what Aubrey was talking about earlier, that sort of like squeaky wheel bias towards, you know, the one person who complains about the digital program. Um, you know, I did have like a very influential person in my organization write to me after our highly visual show, basically saying like, none of my friends and I cared for the visuals. But also thank you for standing in the lobby and saying hi to everybody who came to the show. We like that. So, you know, and um, again, it doesn't have to be expensive, you know, just park yourself in front of the door. Uh, but I think that that tension is always there, but I do think sometimes it's more of a phantom in, in our processes and in our offices and kind of on our teams than, we, than it really actually is in real life as long as you are very careful to put the music forward. You know, and I think that's just a real, like we are about the music, so the music should be front and center of whatever you do. 
I would also add to that, um, this was something we thought a lot about at Music Book when we developed our product. We want to reduce friction. Mm -hmm. And so our product was specifically designed for music instructors. What are the pain points of being a music instructor? Scheduling. Most of us are texting, we're emailing, it's carrier pigeons, it's any number of things, but it's never in one place. Mm -hmm. As a result, communication is also all over the place. It's not organized. And then money collection. It's never fun as a music teacher where you have to be the fun person who's teaching the student, but you also have to be the one to go, hey, Miss Sally, sorry, the check bounced. I need this money again. And so what did we do? We remove that friction. When you think about Uber, when you think about Lyft, why do people use them? Because when you go in, your card is already on file. You simply press a button. And so at our company, when we remove the friction of creating, um, of collecting payment, our teachers' revenue increased by 30% because what happened? The parents already had a credit card on file, so if the student didn't show up to a lesson and it was a no-show, me as a teacher, I'm no longer calling that parent and saying, hey, you still owe me for this lesson. I press a button, they didn't give me 48 hours notice, I still get the money, and the parent probably has so much money in their account, they didn't even realize they missed the lesson. So both people are still paid. You, you laugh, but this is actually the seriousness of it, and I want to accent Aubrey says it best, run it like a business. This mm -hmm. is where we have to think as business owners. How bad is it if 30% of your income was lost because people were not showing up? If you make $100,000 a year, that's $30,000. And we don't think about it a lot in that way because we do, we basically work in a market that's micro payments. It's mm -hmm. $70 here, $70 here. But when you think about the average teacher is teaching 36 to 40 lessons a year, that student is paying anywhere between $3,000 to $5,000 a year. If you have 20 of those students, you're making about six figures roughly. So that 30% starts to add up. And so when you can remove that friction, it creates an opportunity where even your long-term patrons who are used to paying in cash and who'd rather write a check, eventually they start to realize, hey, I'm doing this on everything else, so why shouldn't I do it here? And so you can start to fight back a little bit of that um, negative feedback, if you will. Mm -hmm. This is another question from the audience. Sorry, I was told to stand up because I don't know how much. Guess why? Oh. You too. Oh, okay. get a CD <laughs> from the New Century oh. Chamber Orchestra. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to share that I do. I have a CD player in my 2011 paid-off Toyota Camry. So. Hey, let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Oh, so paid off. Yes. Going. Paid off. Paid <laughs> off. It pays to have an old car. So, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Millie. Uh, and I work for the National Flute Association. Uh, thank you so much for all your insights. So as somebody who is chronically online, I'm sure some of y'all can relate, uh, chronically on social media, it, I see this sense of urgency, or I have a sense of urgency that if we do not get our organizations and specifically orchestras on social media doing the thing, consistently that I, I just don't know how we're going to reach Gen Z and Gen Alpha. I really don't know how we're going to do it. So, and so as somebody who's like, you know, old Gen Z and a baby millennial, like I see that. And so like Gen Z, like they just don't care. I bet, I don't, I don't think a product is the issue. I think it's just the delivery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Aubrey is. I'm like, yes. um, I don't think the product is the issue. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, so anyway, so I know this is kind of a loaded question, but so I don't have a marketing job, so I'm not the person in charge of putting out the content, but how do I, but I, but I see it, right? I see it every day. I'm like, I, I need the content to help me do my job. Um, so how, I guess if you have a loaded question, but maybe tools um, to help me, who's not the person who's in charge of the marketing strategy, like be an advocate for making it, that to have a better sense of urgency that, you know, just posting a picture of your violinist. It's it, like, y'all, you, every time I see somebody post a picture of like a violinist and it gets two likes, like something inside me kind of. Curdles and dies. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm like, like it, why aren't we looking at that and why we're only getting two likes, but then there's 10,000 likes on our Facebook page. Like that, I'm, these are the questions I have every day when I'm on chronically online. So kind of a long thing. Um, and also, the other part two kind of is, as we know, social media changes every goddamn day. Yes. So yes. how, and I yes. feel like our marketing folks, like they can't keep up. I can't keep up as somebody who's trying to build something online, you know, business online. And so again, like, you know, how do we like, I feel like you're just so far behind. Like, how do we 
keep up? Should we keep up? Should we like what should we be doing? Obviously, like we can't take we can't go to we can't go to college for social media. Like, <laughs> like not, not right? Yet. Like, not like <laughs> we can try, but tomorrow <laughs> there's gonna be a next best thing. And I know this is a very loaded question, but I, these are just thoughts in my head. Yeah, so. can I share Please something? Um, yeah, I think I don't think. I love this question, and I think I'm going to zoom out a bit because that question and the last question of like how do we introduce these things to our organization and our longstanding patrons and all, you know all of these things actually have a very similar theme, which is change management. Mm -hmm. So change management, a whole another area. I've gone deep on the research, and what humans want it's the human condition. So we're all like this. When we have grand complex problems, I do think there are some grand complex problems in classical music. When we have that, our brains want an equally complex home run solution. That is just how humans are wired. However, that is not how change happens. And so these questions of how do we get our longtime patrons to come along with us on all this radical change, like I'm not saying do radical change. <laughs> um, I'm saying learn how to pull reports from your CRM, right? I, DeMarcus is saying, I'm not, no, no shade, I'm saying for real though. And then DeMarcus is like, let's reduce friction. Yes, these are things that optimize a business, and sometimes the user doesn't even consciously know what's happening on the front. Sorry, I said user, patron, audience member doesn't always know what's happening on the front end. So then, to Millie's question, it's how do I how do I get somebody else in my organization to understand the importance of this thing that I think is very important? And so that then goes to it's also change management, right? And so I think just. Um, very briefly, I do a lot of work on this, but it goes back to the data. That's why I'm so data-driven, research-driven. It's not Aubrey's opinion. It's this is what the body of research shows. On this particular point of social media, digital presence, there's loads out there. So you can start to share that to make the case. Um, and then the other thing I always recommend, this is change management now boiled down to 10 seconds, but then when somebody, this is true for anything you want to have happen and advance at your organization, when they have the slightest glimmer of doing something right in your eyes, they didn't post the violin video, video that made you die inside, like cheer for it like it's the best thing in the universe. You've got to encourage the behavior you want to see. And so, and that really, I don't know if this sounds silly or not, but it's the basis of change management. And mm -hmm. over many small steps, whether it's reducing friction, cheering somebody on, or any other myriad of like small, tiny baby steps, that is how big sweeping change happens eventually. And then we've brought everybody along with us because it's been digestible along the way. And to accent one small point about change management, this is also why it's so important for young people to be in leadership at these larger music organizations. That's a lo larger, broader conversation, but young people bring young ideas and understand that changing landscape, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are going to get to these last two questions, and I also want to add, we will be standing out in the lobby afterwards if you all have additional questions, because we do want to speak with everyone. You too get a CD oh. from the new <laughs> century. It's, it's, it's the last one. It's the last one. If you really want it, uh, you can have it. It's the last, it's the last one. one. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. I want to see it. Will, it. it will work in my 2013 Honda CRV. But <laughs> um, hi, I'm Rachel Minto with the United States Army Band Pershing Zone in Washington D.C. and I'm our digital media and social media manager. And uh, we have an, an opening right now. It just technically just closed, but you're still interested, let me know. Um, uh, I was wondering if you had any advice for organizations like my own where I'm not allowed to purchase any ads. If I wanna collab with somebody, I, c they, I can't pay them to collab with me. Uh, we don't ticket any events because they all have to be free legally, so I don't have any, any data. If I'm trying to prove that my social media marketing made a difference at all, I think there's nothing for me to to prove that to my leadership and, and encourage investment in social media marketing. Right now I have no dollars for social media marketing. It all goes to traditional marketing at the Washington Post. Um, so, and I, I feel very sad because I feel like we have, you know, these incredible world-class musicians and we're offering all these free concerts um, in, in the, the DMV, the uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And I was wondering if you have any advice for organizations like my own, and I know there was a question online from somebody else that was very similar. Thank you. Yeah. Can I, can I hop yeah, on this? So um, you're competing with Netflix. Yeah. You're competing yeah. with video games. Yeah. Soon you're gonna be competing with VR, with the Apple crazy stuff. So what's really important is learning how to hook your audience but another critical component of developing 
um, any type of content series is seeing what is being done right now and doing your competitive research. See what people are doing right now. See what's working, see what's not working, and then try to add your own spin on it. Like you said, you're part of the Navy, uh, the, the Army band. Well, that, there aren't that many of those. So you have a unique value proposition. So what's the... So what's, the, so what's the particular angle or perspective that's unique to your organization and how can you double, triple, quadruple down on that and tell that story in a, in a very compelling way that's, I hate to say it, you have to hook your audience. You have to shock them. You have to grab them in the first two seconds. If you don't grab them in the first 1.7 seconds of your video, they're not going to stay. And then once you hook them the first time, then you have to deliver on that promise and then hook them again and you have to hook them over and over and over again which is why it's really hard to do which is why we're getting two likes on a post because you didn't hook them the first time so it, I know this isn't an answer that's really satisfying because I, it would take a longer conversation but try to identify your specific strengths of your organization and your unique storytelling angle that can hook your audience awesome. Unfortunately, I am getting a stop sign, but we are going to meet you out here for this last question. I have to wrap this rip. Can I? Hold up. Hold up. I'm fine. No. Sorry, what do we? What do we no. say now? Oh, we're we getting close. We got a flip. Go. Yeah. Go. <laughs> <laughs> pressure. No. So, real quick question. As we utilize apps and technology and AI and know that algorithm based technology tends to have some racial biases, mm -hmm. how do you? utilize those apps and take that into consideration as you're trying to diversify your audience and your patrons? I can actually take that one. Um, I think it's a brilliant question. So with technology, technology is only as smart as we train it. And so um, I'm also going to highlight another, there was a question in the chat that mentioned this about how we're using AI. This is why it's so important for us to be a part of the conversation about developing this technology, because with AI, AI is trained to do that. So as an example, when we go into a bathroom that has an automated sink, sometimes people of color, if we put our hands under the sink, the water will not come on. And it's because those cameras have been trained using lighter co colored skin tones. Mm. And so because of that, it's very important for us to be in the conversation and understand that technology so that we can then train that same technology to recognize there are darker skin tones. There are people who light does not re uh, reflect off of very clearly. And so when you start to think about that, this is where, one, you need to look into who are the founders of the technology. In many cases, the beauty of it is that with a lot of these new companies, the founders' faces are on the website. If you see more diverse founders, if you see women who are part of the conversation, typically these companies have done a lot of the work to make sure that their technology speaks to that diversity. There's a company called Kairos out of Miami where where they do computer vision and the founder is a black guy who specifically said we will not sell to governments because governments want to use our computer vision in order to um, isolate and track down more people of color for traffic stops and things of that nature but it's because he trained the computers to be able to say this person who's shoplifting this person who's shoplifting neither one of them is more of a threat and so it comes back to when you're looking at the technology, one, look at companies who are thinking about that diversity because most of the companies who are thinking about it, it's either going to reflect in their leadership team or it's going to reflect in the marketing communications that they're putting out. The second part of it is if you can't find what you're looking for, create it. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this technology landscape is that there's venture capital out there. There are people who believe what you believe. If you look around this room, these are people who believe in diversity and classical music. So they're going to get behind and support what it is that you're doing. And so if you can find those people, and unfortunately, as hard as it is, sometimes we do have to create our own opportunities. But if you do that, you're saving the next generation who's coming back and who's going to need the exact same things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, thank you all so much for that. Um, in closing, one thing that we should be looking for from each of you all, and then we're going to get off the stage before they throw something at me. One thing we should be looking oh. for. Oh, one thing that the audience should be looking for from you. Oh, coming up. Oh yes. My gosh. February 6th. It's called, <laughs> it's called Run It Like a Business. That's it. Every Friday, I release Grace Notes. It's a newsletter for artists, entrepreneurs, and how to build your business from zero. You know, we have shows happening all year long, but I just want to say the arts are unique. Our uniqueness is our superpower, and so go out there and show it to the world. 
awesome. Thank you all. Yeah.